again, my name is Jody. I am on the teaching team here. I am married to Jeremy right there. I have two sons, Corbin and Owen. Um, I just want to acknowledge that if this is your first time with us, welcome. <laughs> There's, we're, we're in a space. My friend Greg talked about Kairos moments, Kronos moments. Our church is in a Kairos moment. Um, and we started in a living room, and we have a plant. So clearly we are in the living room today. Thank you, Sarah West, the Mary Poppins of plants. There is a um, need for vulnerability, and there's an invitation in vulnerability and in risk-taking, which is why I am up here drinking coffee from a, from a lid, lidless cup in a white dress. I invite you into my risk this morning as I, too, I'm taking a chance. <laughs> we have been teaching and talking about, um, well, we've been teaching through Ecclesiastes. And we want you to know today, whether it's your first time or you've been with us, if you've been with us since the living room, which I have not, actually. I've been here for six years. But if you've been around the world at all, you know that there's a lot of... Um, Hiding. There's a lot of lying to ourselves and to others about the realities that we live in. And today we are hoping that this is an invitation based on all the vulnerability that is expressed here on the stage for you to do something different. If Ecclesiastes has taught us anything in the last 10 weeks, it's that we have but a moment. And that moment we have is this one. The high bowl, the breath of this moment is all we have. It is all we have. And if God is not present in this moment, this one moment that we have, then all is meaningless. So we have this moment. We're inviting you into this moment. The reality is um, Ecclesiastes 10 is, is pfft, from my opinion, so that's a very, very theological term, pfft, is a theological term that means 9 through 11, chapters 9 through 11 are like a mini sermonette that culminate in 12 um, and make all the sense in the world. So preaching on Ecclesiastes 10 is like preaching on the, Lord, the, two, the two towers. You don't, get the, you don't get the backstory and you don't get the ending. And you're like, cool. Cool players, cool, cool set. A lot of money went into this. I don't know. It's still really long and it's only the middle. I don't know. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. It's a lot of wisdom-ish. And um, I was reading in the NRSV, which is one of the translations of the Bible, which, pop quiz, what is the best translation of the Bible? Oh, stop. You, lover, of, oh, beloved, my sweet beloved. Shh. Not, more than one. The best translation of the Bible is more than one, right? More than one. So there are no headings in my Bible for Ecclesiastes chapter 10 because the the talk started in 9, and it finishes in 11, except for the NRSV. The NRSV came for me. Thank you, NRSV. And the title in the NRSV for Ecclesiastes chapter 10 is Miscellaneous Observations. <laughs> Miscellaneous Observations. Well, as I... Set down my scary cup. Let's read some of these miscellaneous observations, Sarah, because we here at Two Rivers are committed to teaching the text. So we're going to read it. We're going to read Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Some of it, not all of it. Uh, miscellaneous chapter observations. Verse 2. A wise person chooses the right road. A fool takes the wrong one. All I'm going to do for this little part is tell you what I wrote in the margin forever in my Bible. And for this one, I wrote, duh. <laughs> All right, chapter eight, or verse eight. <laughs> when you dig a well, you might fall in. When you demolish an old wall, you could get bitten by a snake. When you work in a quarry, stones might fall and crush you. When you chop wood, there is danger with each stroke of your ax. Nowhere is safe. Nowhere is safe, and apparently all that stuff, it clearly happened to people. So it sounds like he's just saying, like, yeah, you cross the road, you get hit by a car, you go to the grocery store, you could have bad fruit experience. It just feels like, thank you, you just never know. Um, chapter 10 is the only place I found any sort of, like, maybe. Uh, verse 10, using a dull axe requires great strength, so sharpen the blade. There's the value. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. Okay. It is worth the time it takes to be wise. That's what I get there. That's good. I wrote that. That felt like a half smile in my Bible. 
Um, I think this morning it's worth the time we're going to take. We're not going to blow past um, what Jason shared because the reality is I know a lot of you come in here, um, come to this room, having left other rooms like this because there was um, unrepented sin that leaked out onto a bigger group. Some of you come in here not necessarily knowing how you feel about church anymore because you've had some bad church experiences. So this could be echoing into that for you. And that makes sense. Because it is hard to be honest when a lot of people need you to be perfect. And we aren't trying to seek perfection. We are trying to seek vulnerability and authenticity. And so if that is you and you're feeling that, keep feeling that. It's okay. There is a leadership team at this church. I'm not on the leadership team. I'm on the teaching team. There is a leadership team at this church that leads. They are not, it is not a, um, just kind of a, oh, we just have a team just to say we have a team. They lead. They lead with vulnerability. They lead with a purpose, and they're trying to lead this group and family on purpose towards something good. That is good. They don't know exactly how to do it, but they're trying to do it differently. They're trying to do it differently. We're trying to do something differently here. And when the authority of a community is invited into something, you as a part of that community are invited into it as well. Which is why when people don't bow to Jesus and they are in authority, they wreak havoc on those they lead. But that is not what you have in front of you today. That's not the invitation that's in front of you. The invitation that's in front of you is something different. The invitation for you is to say, is there something I haven't been courageous enough to look at yet? Because some of you are, are there, and it's eating you alive. And you don't actually know how good it would feel to get it out because the risk of letting it out feels like a bigger risk than just keeping it hidden. And that is an opportunity you have in front of you today. And some of you live with those people. And that has its own effect. Some of you grew up in those homes. Some of us don't want to replicate that in our own homes. We're all in it. We are not exempt. And we are going to take the time to be wise by sitting in that a little bit today. And that's about all I can really get from Ecclesiastes 10 for bringing us today. Because I'm just going to finish with a few more. I'm going to finish with a few more, few more margin notes that are in pen in my Bible forever. So we're going to go to verse, well, my New Living Translation in verse 13 says, Fools base their thoughts on foolish assumptions, so their conclusions will be wicked madness, which sounds like a band. Wicked madness. They chatter on and on. No one, verse 14, no one really knows what is going to happen. No one can predict the future. I just wrote, true. Verse 15 is how I feel about toddlers who go hiking. Okay, just listen to me. Just go with me. Fools are so exhausted by a little work that they can't even find their way home. I'm sorry, toddler that just played on a playground for two and a half hours and then yelled at me when I said we had to go home, but you weren't tired of playing yet. And then we go four feet on a hike that's flat. And you, your legs quit working. I'm so tired, mom. Do you have any snacks? I'm like, what are you talking about? You just ran up and down that slide 94 times in a row. There's like 4,000 feet of elevation gain. And now you're tired? Well, Bible. Okay, toddler's hiking. You can write that down. You can have that one. Laziness leads to a sagging roof, verse 18. Idleness leads to a leaky house. I wrote, clean out my gutters. We have a lot of leaves in our gutters right now. That's what I wrote. Verse 19, a party gives laughter, wine gives happiness, money gives everything. In the margin I just wrote, actually money gives the wine for the party. (laughs) That's it, there's no so then. Um, And the last one, my favorite. Verse 20, never make light of the king even in your thoughts and don't make fun of the powerful even in your own bedroom. For a little bird might deliver your message and tell them what you said. In my Bible, in the margin says, Alexa is always listening. (laughs) So just be careful when you say, order toilet paper, okay? 
I'm not trying to make fun of God's word. I hold God's word in very high esteem. And this chapter wasn't very helpful for me this week. Um, But Ecclesiastes is more than helpful. Lindsay decided in July that our church should teach through Ecclesiastes because she always has her finger on the pulse of what the Lord needs and what we need. And she called it. I think she called it rightly. And she often does. So we are here in Ecclesiastes. The full theme of Ecclesiastes, if you haven't been with us, is that live, I wrote, I wrote, actual good things in my Bible, too, about God's word. Um, And so I have been writing notes about Ecclesiastes in this space, and one of the things that's been a theme in Ecclesiastes is to live wisely, freely, and generously with our death in mind. Life is a breath, this breath, this moment. God makes everything beautiful in its time, and I really do believe that oppression, the anecdote to oppression is relationship. So... The one thing I'm really holding on to from Ecclesiastes 10 that I'm going to give to you today is from the good old NRSV, some miscellaneous observations, (laughs) okay? I have a stack of books up here. I have a chair. What I want to do is I want, I know, um, we can think about sin in a lot of different ways. And I want to share an observation that wasn't mine. There's people smarter than me that write things down that I get to read, and I'm grateful for them. Um, One of them is a woman named Nicole. She wrote this book called Time and Despondency. I got it from my father-in-law. And she has a really good... Now, despondency is a big word, and you can think of despondency. She defines it quickly as simply as this, the rejection of the present moment. So the rejection of the present moment, very in line with Ecclesiastes. So rejecting the present moment, and how do you reject the present moment? By rehashing the past or worrying about the future. You can only experience God in this present moment. So if you're not present in it, you cannot experience God. And despondency is this condition that we take on when we reject the present moment, what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're seeing, where we are, because of a lot of different reasons. And we all do it. It's a a human problem. She also says this, like the body, the soul can become sick, particularly when the mind dominates the heart. The tragedy here is not that sin angers God, but that it erodes our capacity to choose him at all. In this way, the sin of despondency behaves much more like a sickness in need of healing than a crime in need of punishment. The church is or should be a hospital, not a courtroom. Ah, that's an observation that really rings true. So when we are living our lives and we're not present to the moment, what we're losing, what we're, what, we're, what we're forfeiting is the ability to choose God in that moment. And if we have a bunch of moments in a row where we're not able to choose God, then that is what causes all of the things to then tumble forward into anxiety, loneliness, depression, the things that we see. And we need each other not to do that. <laughs> there are a lot of things, most of our hurt actually happens in relationship, which is unfortunate because all of our healing also must happen in relationship. And that's hard because when you allow people to actually know them, to be in their lives, then you are then exposed to what hurts them and then what hurts them then starts to hurt you. And then, oh, you want to fix that and we can't fix everything. Um, but it only can be healed in relationship with the creator of the universe and with people around you. And that's hard to make space for people. And we're trying to make space for people here. Um, And just so you know, there, there has to be space at your table for people you don't want to sit there. And so while there are things we're, not af- we're afraid to look at, there's a lot of things that we can learn about who God is by opening up who we are going to be with and in full, I don't know if it's full, in a, in a degree of transparency that fe- you know, feels a little shaky. It's like for me, I, I know um, that sometimes when I teach, some people opt out for their own reasons And I want you to know there is a seat at my table for them. That's okay. It's not how I want it to be, but I understand and it's okay. And I have to do work to keep that seat open and to know that it's okay. To think differently, but still be a part of the same family. Um, And so I've gotten to learn another perspective about who gets to sit at the table in a relationship with a young woman named Danny. And I want you to hear her story because it captivated me. It has captivated me. So I would like you to clap so it's not weird and let my friend Danny come to the stage. Woo! Woo! 
It's like the big comfy couch right here. I feel like the girl on the big comfy couch. My feet can't touch the floor. Hi, Danny. Hello, Jody. <laughs> Danny, where, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little autobiographical information about yourself. <laughs> um, I am from Aurora, Colorado originally. I am now um, in Fort Collins just for school, but my parents are from very different places. My mother's from Uganda, um, a country in Africa, some of you don't know that, and then my father is from Vermont. Um, Can I just highlight that classic Uganda-Vermont connection, am I right? <laughs> it's just classic. Um, uh, <laughs> Search. It was funny the first service too, because you knew it was coming. You didn't laugh the first service. Um, but I've just seen that um, the relationship that I have with my parents, um, the fact that they come from two very different cultures has helped me to have a, a different perspective, I think, than a lot of people that might be here who don't have that same background. Um, but the two cultures, I think, have helped me to understand God in two different ways as well, I think, or um, in more way than one, so. And so why are you at CSU? What are you studying? Are you, are you studying or are you just there? Do you just live on campus? <laughs> just there, <laughs> just visiting. Um, I go to CSU, I'm studying biology right now and I'm hoping to become an integrative medical doctor. Yep. So if you don't know what that is, she's smart. That's all you really need to take from that. Thank you. Uh -huh. So um, can you just tell us why you love Jesus? Yes. Put the mic close to your mouth. Yep. Yes, yep. Wow, well, yeah. Um, I love Jesus because he first loved me. Um, he provides so many different things for me. Um, relationship, peace, love. But I think he truly just loves me. And that's like the most that I can get out of that. There's... No way that I can love him fully or respond in the same way that he does love him as much as he loves me. But I love him because he chose to love me. He chose to love my family, my friends, all of you. Um, I think that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you have an interesting perspective because of how you grew up. You have very different angles and different views on the world based because you, that's all you know. Um, could you... From your vantage point, kind of tell us what you think, what you hope for this church based on the perspective you have. What is your hope for our church? Um, my deep hope for this church is that all of you will be willing and want to come and sit at the table um, with people who don't look like you, who are not from the same background, um, people who you might not necessarily like. Um, I had the privilege this week of talking with a number of individuals who I don't think would really fit into this scene. Um, they are black, Hispanic, um, Asian, gay, straight, like everything, old, young. Um, and I asked them why they don't feel comfortable here. Like why they, they who know God, why they don't feel comfortable coming into this church and being a part of this family. Um, and the response, they, there was many things, but the biggest response that I got was that they don't think that we are willing to come and sit at the table with them um, and experience what they're experiencing to humble ourselves and live what they are living. Um, and I can say personally that I've also experienced that. Um, I have many times in my life been an outlier um, And it was hard because God's kingdom, this place, was somewhere that I wanted to call home so badly, but it is just not a place that I had felt safe uh, stating my opinions, stating or allowing people to know who I am truly, I guess. And so I just want to invite you guys um, to sit at the table as Jesus sat at the table with sinners and to come without judgment and um, with love. So it's a, it costs Danny a lot more to be in this room than it costs some of us um, just because of that. It's not, she's, there's others of us that have a story, have a similar perspective, and I know you're there too, but um, we all have places potentially where we don't, um, there are a lot of places where there, you can feel like a minority perspective. Um, you could be the only woman in a room. 
You could be the only person over 60 in a room. You could be the only person under 20 in a room. You could be the only male teacher at an elementary school. All right, There's a, that is a minority position also. Um, there are places where we all um, understand that it's like, oh, I don't totally know like, people don't know this about me, or this is my background, and so when I come, and, I, and the moment you have the courage to finally offer a little bit of how it feels, and it's not met with curiosity, but instead met with, that's probably not true, or is it really that bad, or, but yeah, but, yeah, but, because we start to feel uncomfortable, because as a person who wants to be a part of these conversations and has failed freely in many of them, I'm terrified to say the wrong thing. I'm scared to say the wrong thing. I am scared to say the wrong thing to people. I'm scared to, I work with people with disabilities. When I first started, I had no idea how to, still today, is it people with disabilities? Is it kids with special needs? Is it neurodivergent? I don't, I don't know, sometimes just say something. And my friend Ian always says, well, just say something and then be willing to be corrected. And I'm like, okay. But that's hard. And so I just want you to know it's hard. It's not easy, it's hard. Um, and I know that there is willingness coming out of our ears in this church. There is willingness in this room to see and be seen. And what I wanted to do, I asked Danny to take a really big risk, and she said yes. Um, to just take a little moment to say, oh, this, is, this could, could we let it be real? Could we let her experience be true? Could we let someone else's experience be true? Um, and, and, know, and pay attention enough to ourselves to be like, this makes me uncomfortable because of X, Y, Z, but could I let this experience be true? Um, and I appreciate that about you. Is there anything else you'd want to add um, to what you want the church just to know? Because you're still here, though. You've been here for a, a minute, right? Like, you're saying all these things, but you are here. Yes. Why? I did forget to mention that. Yeah, that's um. okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think that I felt confident enough to come up and say all these things in the first place because this is such a grace-filled church. Um, I have been met with love and with relationship, and I've, I've seen that it's so possible for us to have these hard conversations, um, but it's just so obvious to me that we have God's grace and that this church is willing to be welcoming. I think we just need to be reminded sometimes and see the opportunity, I guess. That's right, because relationship is the anecdote. Mm -hmm. So willingness is not enough, but willingness plus the right information can be powered by the Spirit of God, and I believe that for us too. Um, here's the, I'm gonna, you're about to learn the most amazing part about Danny, which maybe isn't the most amazing. I don't know everything yet. There's probably more amazingness in there to mine out. We were, I was like, do you have time to do two services on Sunday? And this was her response. Well, yes, because Sundays are my Sabbath, so I don't schedule anything. What? You're in college. Tell me about that. So, Danny, why do you have a Sabbath? Um, I started my Sabbaths about two years ago, um, and I started it because I was tired. I, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I didn't, um, I don't know, I never felt that I was fully rested. I would sleep, um, I would eat, I would take care of my body, but there was, like, no end to my fatigue, I guess. Um, so that was the initial reason that I started it. And I don't know, through it I found presence, I guess. Um, I've been able to actually fully sit with God, sit with myself, and see that life is actually beautiful, I guess. I think we were talking about before last service, um, the difference between like before and after. Mm -hmm. And... I feel alive, I guess, is what I was saying. I feel like I'm able to sit here and experience this moment and actually be happy about it and glad that I'm able to speak in front of you guys and have this opportunity um, instead of the fear and anxiety that I think that I've experienced before. Um, but it's given me a point of relationship, deep relationship with God where I've prioritized him to the point of giving up a whole day for him. Um, and it's helped all of my other relationships because I'm present with him. I'm present, more present in all of my other relationships as well. So that's cool. We could let's just clap for that. Let's just clap for that. Let's... I know I'm embarrassing you. I know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> um, that presence, that being in the moment, 
being able to do that. Um, I think that's why you're still here. Um, that's a reservoir in the land of canals. She's a reservoir, and because of that reservoir, she's been able to stay in a place that was uncomfortable. Um, so can you say anything about comfort to our church as we close? Oh, yeah. Um, I feel like in a lot of ways, I, I don't want to say forced, but I've been forced out of my comfort zone. Um, just living like in a mixed race family, I, I have to... <laughs> um, choose every day to be silent about things that I don't want to be silent about to live in uncomfort because if I said something it might upset somebody else and cause a whole other thing um, and I think that God invites us into uncomfort constantly that is how you have deep relationship with people is by living in their uncomfort with them mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to challenge you guys I guess to be uncomfortable um, to realize that you're not going to grow if you stay comfortable with where you're at in your relationships with God and your relationships with people as well, too. Mm -hmm. I feel like we should clap after everything you say, but we're not going to make you do it again. Um, there's a risk. There's a lot of risks being taken on stage. We've mentioned the coffee. We're very aware of this coffee situation, how risky it is. The band Miranda just holding the fort down by herself. Um, Lindsay and Jason offering their story, and I felt like it was a risk to talk about something like race or uh, minority perspectives. It was always feels like a risk in a large group uh, because what happens out there can be brought in here, and instead of hearing one young woman's story about what it's been like to be here, we think it's attached to an agenda, and we immediately start to argue that agenda in our minds instead of listen to the heartbeat that's in front of us. And that feels like a risk, but um, I think it's a risk that we can take and, are, and can do here. But I just want to acknowledge that it's okay if it's like there's things happening. There's things happening inside of you, whether you're like resonating with what she's saying or whether you're like, ah, this makes me, I've been, I've had this other bad experience around this conversation and it makes me, uh, yes, of course, yes, 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 and all of it is here. All of it is welcome. We're not going to run or hide from things because they're uncomfortable, but we do need to name the uncomfort, the discomfort, um, and I think we can do that in this place, and I think we must um, to follow the Jesus who went before us. Um, anything else before we have a little story time? Just when, You don't have to have anything else. No. <laughs> no? Great. Okay. Story time. <laughs> in the living room. This is a book called... I hold this like none of you can see this. Um, at the back of the North Wind, George MacDonald is an author who lived at the turn of the 19th century, and he wrote some stuff. And C.S. Lewis read his stuff. And when C.S. Lewis read George MacDonald's stuff, he says, my, bap my imagination was baptized. I was like, okay. Well, C.S. Lewis wrote some cool stuff. So this guy, and I'm pretty sure C.S. Lewis stole the idea for the wardrobe of Narnia if you've read that series from George MacDonald in some of his earlier work. So George MacDonald, this is a children's book. It's about a young boy named Diamond who has an encounter with the North Wind. And the North Wind is depicted as just this powerful divine presence. And she is taking Diamond on some adventures. And he is engaging with her in a way that is really beautiful. And one of the most powerful lines in fiction that I've ever read that relates to what Danny's inviting us into um, is in this. And so I'm going to read one page to you from at the back of the North Wind. Sweet Diamond is being invited up to go on a journey with the North Wind. So just imagine being with the wind. A wind who's sinking ships and also opening up tulips. Diamond. Diamond trembled so at the thunder that his knees failed him and he sunk down at the north wind's feet and clasped round that column of her ankle. She instantly stooped, lifted him up from the roof, up, up, up into her bosom and held him there saying as if to an inconsolable child, Diamond, dear, this will never do. Oh, yes, it will, answered Diamond. I'm all right now, quite comfortable. I assure you, dear north wind, if you only let me stay here in your bosom, I shall be all right indeed. Oh, but Diamond, said the North Wind, you will feel the wind here. I don't mind that a bit, so long as I feel your arms through it, answered Diamond, nestling closer to her grand bosom. Brave boy, returned North Wind, pressing him closer. No, said Diamond, I don't see that courage. It's not courage at all, so long as I feel you there. 
but hadn't you better get into my hair, Diamond? Then you would not feel the wind. You could be right here. Oh, but dear North Wind, you don't know how nice it is to feel your arms about me. It is a thousand times better to have them and the cold wind together than to have only your hair in the back of your neck and no wind at all. But surely, Diamond, it'll be more comfortable back there. Well, perhaps, North Wind, but I begin to think there are better things than being comfortable. Thank you, Danny, for sharing your story. You, Let's clap her off the stage. Okay, land in the plane. I'm proud of us. I'm proud of me, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of us, I'm proud of us. Whew. Quote from this book right here, Sue Monk Kid, the truth will set you free, but first it will shatter the safe, sweet way that you live. So there's a reason we hide, because we don't want to be shattered, and that's okay. Maybe it's time, though. <sighs> Ninty Wright is a current, um, these are just more um, miscellaneous observations. N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar. He's in England, and he writes a lot of work about the New Testament, and this is his definition of grace, acting decisively on someone's behalf. The first act, of course, being God creating, and then Jesus coming for us. The first de acting decisively on our behalf without our request or our permission, God came, lived, died, rose again, will return. There has been grace in this church. This leadership team has acted decisively on people's behalf. Would you let your community do the same? Or maybe you need to help someone else. This page. God doesn't want our wooing. God wants our hearts beat by beat, breath by breath, turn by turn. Nicole also says in her book, Time and Despondency, it is easier to go way out of the way once in a while than it is to go a little bit out of the way all the time. The people in our lives don't need grand gestures. They don't need one-time things. They don't need a moment, um, a big moment every once in a while. They need the discipline of us turning towards them a little bit every day. And God wants that from us too. God doesn't need the once a year spiritual retreat, the once a year, God, it's all of me, I'm back, I'll see you next year. He wants a little bit of us turning towards him every moment of every day. And the reason that people don't do that, because it's harder. It's harder, but it's not better. Okay. My last confession. I... When I hear about other people's pain and I get in relationship with other people, I want to fix it all and I get really angry about a lot of things and I want to call down destruction. And that anger lives in me and it comes out like everything, mostly on my husband. And without his kind, gentle, just like, darling, I don't know if you wanna always be this way. And I'm like, am I always this way? And sometimes, and that's hard. And it's hard for him to have to say that to me and it's hard for me to receive it. And I'm grateful for it. Um, and Matt Canalis, in this book um, called The Backyard Pilgrim, 40 Days at Godspeed, says that one of the things we need to be as people is we need to say to God, here I am, not calling down destruction. Because in Luke 9, 5, the, Jesus' disciples said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? There was a situation going on. You can go read about it. And Jesus rebuked them and said, no. And then Jesus, when he himself had opportunity to call down destruction on those who were trying to murder him, says, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Here he was, my God, not calling down destruction. So what I hope for us is that in our life groups, in our workplaces, in our school study groups, when we start to hear about things, we hear other people's stories, that we don't get swept up in arguing and calling down destruction on ideologies and thoughts that we don't agree with. And instead, we stop those conversations and we turn inward with the people we're with in the present moment and say, what is God doing in me right now? Let's not be people who argue and call down destruction. Let's be people who become someone 
And that's hard because it's safer to put the anger out here than it is for me to repent and say, I don't want to be that person. Lord, what are you doing in me? What are you doing in the person across from me? Let's not just sit and agree that they suck. Let's become different people. I think that's what Danny's inviting us into. And how do we become different people? We just listen to other people's stories with curiosity. And maybe the gift is listening to your own story with a little curiosity. Maybe shame is telling you you shouldn't be this way when actually if you listen to your own story, you would say that makes sense. That makes sense, actually. Where could we go from here? So I'm going to ask the band Miranda to come up. (laughs) Yes, she heard the cue from the sound room, the green room where the peanut M&Ms are. (laughs) She's going to play some beautiful piano music while I read a prayer over us, and then we are going to worship together. This is a prayer poem written by Amina Brown, and the title of the poem is called, She Said, How Do You Know When You're Hearing From God? It's the name of the poem. She said, how do you know when you're hearing from God? She said, how do you know when you're hearing from God? I didn't know how to explain. It's to explain the butter grit of cornbread to a mouth that's just discovered it has a tongue. It's the sound of jazz to ears that only ever thought they'd be lobes of flesh. The sight of sunsets to blinded eyes that in an instant can see. To fail at the ability to give words to how the scent of baked bread can make the mind recall a memory, every detail of a house, a room, a conversation. Like explaining to a newborn baby, this is what it feels like to be held. My words never felt so small, so useless, so incapable. I learned from my great-grandmother how to pray, how to talk to God, how to listen. Watching her and the other silver-haired church mothers gather in her living room, worn, wrinkled hands on top of leather Bibles, well-traveled. And despite what the laws say or what our human flaws say, God's ears don't play favorites. God's ears don't assess bank accounts or social status before they attune themselves to the story your tears or your fears are telling. God's ears are here for the babies. God's ears are here for the immigrant, the refugee, the depressed, the lonely, for the dreamers, the widow, the orphan, the oppressed and the helpless, those about to make a mess or caught up in the middle of cleaning one up. Dirt don't scare God's ears because our God is a gardener. God knows things can't grow without sun, rain, and soil. That God cares about the moments we find ourselves on the edge of a cliff, on the edge of sanity, on the edge of society. Even when we have less than an inch left of the thread that's been holding us together. I wanted to tell her that God is always waiting, lingering after the doors close and the phone doesn't ring. And we are finally alone. God is always saying, I love you. I'm here. Don't go. Stay, please. I try to explain how God is pleading with us to trust, to love, to listen. That God's voice is a melody and bass lines and whisper and thunder and grace. How so many of us, just like her, just like me, just like you, are still searching, still questioning, still doubting. I know I don't have all the answers. I know I never will that sometimes the best thing we can do is to put our hands in the middle of our chest. (sighs) Feel the rhythm there. Turn down the noise in our minds, in our lives, and whisper, God, whatever you want to say, I'm here, and I'm listening. Let's worship.